Hello and good evening to you. Welcome. This is Ghana Tonight. We are live from a news up here at Tante Sawe Kanda, also live on TV Ghana on Facebook, DSV Channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. Tonight, accused persons in this case of Cecilia Adapa increased to eight. That's what we're hearing now. The stolen cash and other properties as further investigation leads to other revelations. We'll tell you how the Attorney General's advice has informed a new chart sheet that has led to the suspects, in this case, increasing to eight. Stay with us. Also, pressure mounts on the governor of the central bank, Dr. Ernest Addison, to resign following the over 60 billion losses posted in the 2022 financial year. The positioning NDC has given him a 21-day ultimatum, else they would occupy the central bank. We have some experts' opinion on this matter. Stay with us. Also, the coup in Niger is beginning to have a negative impact on the cross-border trade and the Ghanaian markets are beginning to feel the heat. We are in the Ajen Kotoku Anian market to assess the impact of the Niger situation on the Anian sellers there. And the key players in the agri sector have also been sharing their thoughts on this, that if this continues, it may lead to an increase in the price of onions on the market in the coming weeks. But this is something that we're going to be doing some assessment analysis of. But as always, you're very, very part of the program tonight. Um, let's hear from you. The, the, the hashtag we're using is Ghana tonight on Facebook and Twitter. Let's get talking. There are some interesting developments, both in this Bank of Ghana case and the Cecilia Dapa case, which we're going to be getting into tonight. You want to stay with us. Let's settle for Ghana Briefs. The minority in parliament say they will occupy the premises of the Bank of Ghana show that governor failed to resign over the 60 billion CD loss posted by the central bank. At a news conference, the NDC MPs questioned the basis of ongoing construction for a new head office for the central bank amidst the country's economic challenges. The actions of the governor and his inactions has actually collapsed the central bank ahead of the domestic debt exchange. <music> Leaders of Niger's ruling military junta say they cannot accept a high-level diplomatic visit because there would be a risk to their security. Delegates from the regional grouping ECOWAS, the African Union and the United Nations had been due to fly in on Tuesday. But the coup leaders told ECOWAS that sanctions and the threat of invasion for the bloc had created public anger so the delegation couldn't be hosted with calm and insecurity. Ramani Mahama the minister pledged commitment to seeing out the housing project. <music> Government has announced the introduction of new tax terms on fruit juices, sweetened beverages, electronic cigarettes and other liquids from September 1 to conform to the ECOWAS directive. Commissioner in charge of Domestic Tax Division at the Ghana Revenue Authority, Edward Apenteng Jamara, also said implementation of the excise tax stamp on textiles at entry points will take effect on October 1. If you bring in any product that has not been stamped, which is, which is supposed to attract excise tax, then of course we'll use the law to enforce that. <laughs> Well, you'll find more news on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. Coming up next here on Ghana Tonight, pressures mounting on the governor of the central bank, Dr. Ernest Addison, to resign following the over 60 billion CDs loss posted in the 2022 financial year. The position in D.C. is the latest to make that call, giving the governor a 21-day ultimatum. Else, uh, they would occupy the Bank of Ghana. As a matter of fact, earlier today, uh, the leader of the minority group in parliament and also the former deputy finance minister, Dr. Kesela Tofosi, said they will occupy the premises of the central bank should the governor fail to resign over the 60 billion CDs loss posted by the Bank of Ghana. 
at the end of 2022. This was at the news conference earlier today at the NDC headquarters. Take a look. As we speak, the central bank has a negative equity of 55 billion Ghana cities. Negative equity. Now, it means that they don't have any surplus, any money there. He's building a head office at a cost of two fifty million dollars. This simple means that he's printed additional money to finance the construction of the, of the new head office. So this guy will not stop. And Prime said that is the fastest growing uh, uh, building uh, in, 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 in Accra, project in Accra, in Ghana. So if we tell you that since he's the printer, he's only printed by the day. We are urging you all, colleagues, fellow Ghanaians, our brothers and sisters from the media, that join us in this call. It is for us to secure our country. We have to get this man out. Let us get a new governor and let that governor come in and learn that the predecessor was pushed out for ABC, so he will not go there. If we are not careful and we are to allow this governor to stay in the office, what will happen is that we will set bad precedent for future managers to do safe and to destroy our livelihood. He has depleted Ghana's reserve to about one week of import power. The finance minister informed us that even with the IMF money, additional drawdown from the IMF, by the end of the year, Ghana's net international reserve will be about three weeks. Three weeks. Is this the government want to keep in office? He has messed us up so much that we cannot wait to see his back, wait to one day's time to say bye-bye to the So that's Dr. Kesela Tofo saying earlier today, but there is a reference that has been made to the position of the law on the Bank of Ghana financing, which is actually the basis for, for all these calls that are being made. And I, I'm going to tell you that it's not just the NDC that is making this call about the governor resigning, but this is, this is the position of the law on the financing of the government business by the Bank of Ghana. There's a reason why they put a cap to it. Section 30 Act 612 as amended of the Bank of Ghana Act 2016. You see there, the total loans, advances, purchases of treasury bills and other securities made under subsection one shall not at any time, the emphasis on the shall not at any time exceed 5% of the total revenue of the previous fiscal year. It is this position of the law that both, not just the NDC, but a number of experts have made reference to, and the fact that, indeed, the Bank of Ghana went beyond this 5%. There was no notice to Parliament. And questions have been raised about what exactly the governor was doing and what the money that was said to have been suspiciously printed was used for. Let's hear from Professor Godfrey Bocking, who also makes the point about the governor resigning, and he gives reasons why. He's a professor of finance at the University of Ghana Business School. I spoke to him earlier. Take a look. And, and even though somewhere before the first half of... Um, um, last year, there was an issue about the central bank printing cities to finance the budget deficit, and to some extent that was denied. But we knew it was just a matter of time, and that the whole truth will be made public. Uh, we got the first hint of that when the IMF team arrived in Ghana, after, uh, when the government, the president made a call to Washington uh, on the 1st of July. We knew that that was the beginning of, of a lot more disclosure in terms of what was actually going on at the central bank because the IMF would bring that to bear. That is what we are seeing. Um, if you look at the level of exposure, you pick the total domestic debt as at the end of 2022. Bank of Ghana's exposure to the central bank alone was 77.6 billion cities. That was quite high. 77.6 so billion? Is, yes, that was the total exposure of the central bank, Bank of Ghana to Ghana government, 77.6 billion cities. 
Now, if you look at the total domestic debt at that time, at the end of December 2022, we're looking at something around 259 billion CDs. Then the treasure bill component had been excluded. And, and, and that was really the only avenue that the government had left to interact with the financial markets. We are undermining confidence in our financial system. Remember, the central bank could be policy solvent, but that doesn't restore total confidence in our system. It doesn't restore total confidence in terms of correspondent banking. Look, if, if you look at what has happened to the banks, many of them have had to revise their, their line of credit and course, in terms of correspondent banking with the outside world. In a serious society, uh, uh, I believe that uh, maybe the governor would advise himself and resign. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, the governor would have resigned by now. I mean, you know, even though they found themselves in a very difficult situation, I think the central bank intentionally compromised its uh, uh, independence, uh, sold its birthright to the government in the, in the first place. So, the governor should resign. Is that a position you share? No, no, I, I, I don't think we are, we, we, we are there yet. Um, and if you look at the reasons that are ascribed, uh, the, there were internal and external factors, and especially, um, as I indicated, is the impact of the domestic debt exchange that, that, that has impacted our balance sheet. Well, so uh, the Bank of Ghana officials say, you know what, we're, we're not there yet for the governor to, to resign or step aside. Well, Franklin Kujo is a governance expert. He's a founding president of Imani Africa. He's joining us on the telephone. Mr. Kujo, thank you so much for joining us on Ghana tonight. So this is the position of the central bank that it, it was not getting to the point where the, the governor will have to step aside, really, because they ascribe everything to the impact of the DDEP. From the governor's perspective, how does this sit with you? All right, well... It looks as if uh, if people have been uh, have superintended a bankruptcy of a country, uh, then of course uh, those people ought to be held liable for for the bankruptcy. You know, one, one thing I don't understand is that if the central bank is now saying that well we are no longer going to lend to government beyond, but that's the law. You're not supposed to break it in the first place, right? So what's this memorandum being signed left, right, and center? Look, I would have called for a refund, probably a significant amount of refund uh, to the state by this bank officials. Because this whole idea of just saying resignation and then just leave it there, it, it doesn't bode well. If someone has stole that type of money mm -hmm. from the system, the person will be dealt with. The likes of Atoyesian, who are being dealt with right now, uh, probably committed almost the same things, really. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's the way I see it. In, in, so indeed. I, I don't see how we can just wish these kinds of things away. I, I don't understand it. Okay. There's a clear law. You're not supposed to breach it. You breach the financial uh, code. And you do it so such impunity that the hoping sum of 60, 60 billion Ghana cities can just be wished away just like that. And I so-called practice of DDE, well, of course, all of us suffered, oh, okay. uh, and we are still suffering, uh, what's it called, through the debt exchange. But I don't think it is just we should take it kindly and lightly that officials can just explain it away that, oh, you know, because of because we borrowed money to government and some of the money's got banks. Well, you shouldn't have done that in the first place, even if we were supposed to do that, you were supposed to do that right. within the law. Okay. To the extent mm -hmm. that you went beyond it and are now trying to tell us that you no longer seen the gain, uh, fact of the matter is that the money belongs to people, right? Whether it was through your dexterity that some, some profits was earned, which is precisely the reason why you have been appointed as uh, central bank, uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. So you are acting on behalf of us. Now that you've caused this colossal sum of uh, loss, I don't see why you should be left off kindly by an explanation that I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> it is not one of those things you commit and 
you are just left off like I, I'll just give you a scenario. I mean, assuming Alfred, I mean, God forbid, mm -hmm. that someone else must have embezzled the money and your name was used as a guarantor. You, you'll, be in, you'll be in hot water well, well, as we speak. Well, uh, so, so how so come the guarantor, the trustees of our money, can just wantonly dis, 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 disregard, spend recklessly, and then we just say, oh, uh, I bet you ain't see no, 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 no. I don't think. I think they should be made to refund a significant portion. They should take a significant haircut for the next five years or ten years as they remain. Almost everybody who was party to this this deal, they should take significant haircuts in their pensions, in their uh, monuments, uh, whatever they get, salaries up until the time they leave office. At least declare, if not two thirds of the debt uh, or this loss, or probably at least half of it. I don't understand why we should just say, oh, we, the resignation, uh, even the minority calling for the resignation, and then what happens? The money just goes, just mm -hmm. like that. Ah, I don't think it makes sense at all. Uh, so for me, this, this conversation gets me quite frankly annoying. Look, <laughs> and, and if, I, if I monitor the sentiments of many people and our viewers as well, it's also almost on the same tangent. You made reference to why some people are even standing trial or why some financial institutions, commercial banks, were closed down by the central bank some years ago. Issues of corporate governance, non-performing loans, credit risk, I mean, related party lending or, or transactions. You see that also playing out um, in this particular instance, is it not? So for you, the, the accountability demand must not just be they being asked to resign, but they should also be made to pay part of the loss. I mean, the people at the central bank? Yeah, I mean, if that, we can we can we can meet them halfway. They could write off a third of it, but two thirds must be paid back to us. You see, uh, so that the bank will learn that just the fact that there was a, a, a limit to which they could, they could never go beyond must be respected. So this memorandum or whatever memoranda that is being exchanged is quite frankly annoying. I mean, why are you telling us that? Oh, I've signed a memorandum. I'll be a good behavior. This is not a secondary school where you, you are found one thing and you, you, you are signed to make the sign a bond. No, 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 no. This is people's money. <laughs> it's our money. You, your salaries, you've taken it. Your, 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 your monuments, you've taken it. Your pensions are guaranteed. Why should the, 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 the money for the, uh, the, the, the rest of the citizenry be, be, be splashed and be wasted that way? There must be consequences. And I think that we should reach a fine agreement that at least they should also take significant hectare, maybe two thirds of their salaries going forward will be put into a sinking fund and help reco recover the money. That's the way it should be. It should, it should, it should be. This whole business of trying to run government as if there's somebody else's enterprise, it, it, it doesn't make sense to me. And if your central bank loses the plot, I mean, to think that you sat back and allow the central bank, sorry, the government to fiscally pledge, you didn't say anything. I mean, well, to be fair to Addison, a, number, a few times he's made some cut calls basically suggesting that uh, government should watch its fiscal, uh, whatever, its fiscal uh, functions and all of that. But that's where it ends. I mean, if you were to rate them in properly, you wouldn't be giving them, uh, giving them so much leverage and so much money to the extent that you, I mean, will lead us into this particular deep hole. I, I don't think they've been, they've been fair to us at all. I, I think they should be made to pay significant portions of their money. That's what should be done. So, Franklin Kujo, appreciate your time. Thank you very much for joining us here on Ghana Tonight. And, well, the minority in NDC in Parliament has also stated their line of action about this matter going forward. And, and so we'll see how the coming days will look like, especially with the call of accountability in this particular case. This is Ghana Tonight. Coming up next, accused persons increase uh, to eight in the matter of Cecilia Dapas stolen cash and other property as further investigations leads to other revelations um, after the AG's advice in fact has informed some new charges so now we've seen the increase in the number of persons who are actually standing trial in this Cecilia Dapa case started from four persons accused went to to five and now we are seeing eight persons who are, are being accused of their involvement at various stages in this particular case. Now, the new charge sheet 
or the amended charge sheet, big pardon, the amended charge sheet that we got from the court of law today on this matter contains very interesting detail which we have summarized for you. My colleague Dennis Barberi Wadam has been combing through this uh, amended charge sheet um, to, to get a sense of how things really lo look like. He's joining me. Dennis, always great to have you. So now Thank we you have for having me. three different charge sheets in the public domain now? Yes, three charge sheets have surfaced in the public domain. But it is important to state that the latest charge sheet as we have is what we have, um, this one. Mm -hmm. yeah, so there's the latest one, which means that this overrides any other charge sheet which has been in the public domain. I see. So we started off with a charge sheet which was out there, dated on the 5th of July 2003. It had four accused persons on it, mm -hmm. as has been shown here. Then we move on to another charge sheet. So this is the other ch second charge sheet that came yes. through? Yes, and even with this one, we're told this was a third amended charge sheet. So it meant wow. there was one, another before this one. And this is dated the 20th day of um, July 2022, 2023. And mm -hmm. this is when actually the, this uh, issue became a big issue. Then right. the accused persons were five. So if you compare this to the earlier one, you'd notice that the earlier one had four accused persons. Mm -hmm. That so, particular one, as of the 20th of July, had five accused persons. So who was added? Who was added in this fifth? The, the first one had... had okay, so the persons. first one had patience, Bochui. It had ben Benjamin Sowa. It had Kweku Bochui. It had Malik Dauda. So when you look at the second one, that had Sarah Eji added. Oh, who is Sarah Eji? Now Sarah Eji is the former house help of the former Minister of Sanitation. I see. Patient Bochui is the house help who was in the house at the time the event happened. Mm. As we move on, the number of accused persons increased, and this is the latest that we have. Um, yes, so you would see up there, further amended charge sheet. Mm -hmm. And today now, we have eight accused persons in there. Eight persons. It's important to state that in this particular charge sheet, fortunately for one person, he has been discharged, so his name has accordingly been struck off this um, charge sheet. So that's, um, that's who? Kweku Boche? Yes, that's Kweku Boche. Who is Kweku Boche and, and why has he been struck out? Kweku Boche is the father of Patience Boche. And if you follow the narrative so far, um, the story told, or per the brief facts, is that Patience Boche is the house help who was in the house, the former minister, uh, at the time the incident happened. Mm -hmm. She is one of two who are allegedly conspired to steal money and other valuables from the house of the former Minister of Sanitation, um, Cecilia Abinadapa. Now, according to investigations, mm -hmm. Patience Bochui gave part of the money to his father, who is Kweku Bochui. But if you recall, the last time we had a conversation on this, it was the AG advising on the docket of this particular matter. That's right. Now, the CID had referred this to the AG, to advise. On the AG's advice, AG pointed out that the charge that was leveled against Kweku Bochi, which was dishonestly receiving, mm -hmm. to say that he had received some um, booty or some loot or proceeds of crime, mm -hmm. could not be sustained because per their investigations, it came to bear that even though he received some amount of money from his daughter, which was allegedly stolen, that he did not know that the money was stolen. I see. And so that's why Kweku Bochui has been struck out. Yes, that's why he has been struck out. Okay, so who are the new uh, uh, accused persons who have been added, which so, brings the number to eight? Well, so with the new accused persons, mind you, the old ones are still there. So we still have to keep it there. Mm -hmm. So Patience Bochui is still in there, a headdresser and a former house help. Sarah Bochui is in there. Benjamin Sowa is in there. So Sarah Bochui, like I explained earlier, is the former house help. Right. Benjamin Sowa is the boyfriend of Patience Bochui. Malik Dauda is the ex-boyfriend of Patience Bochui, who we are told has a child with her. I see. Uh, now the new additions begin here. Christiana Achap. Who is Christian Achap? She's a trader. 
and that opens a different dynamics into this case. Interesting. For all the expenditure we were told in the earlier facts, this also brings in some different expenditure altogether. And this is the part where some revelations have been made as to other properties that the money allegedly stolen was used to acquire. Hmm. I'll tell you that pretty shortly. But let's tell look at who it. else has been um, charged in here too. Now there's Job Pomare. Now Job, we are told, is the husband of Christiana. That is the, the other new person. The new person. Okay. There's also Franklin Sarako. I mentioned him before, Yaya, because Franklin is said to be the son of um, Christiana. So it means Christiana, the husband, and the, and the son. son. All of them have been accused or charged with dishonestly receiving. What did they receive dishonestly? Part of the money allegedly stolen. And so we what? are told per the brief fact again that patient Boche gave part of the money, an undisclosed amount of dollars, to his brother, who is now deceased. That brother gave part of the money to um, Christiana. Now, we are told Christiana received a little over 2.8 million of that CDs. 2.8 million CDs? Yes. Some of the things she used the money for um, include that she, in fact, she was the one who was given the, uh, the $70,000 to buy the house at Mahia for patients' butchery. She allegedly also bought another um, 11 units of chamber and hall self-contained somewhere in Budumburam for herself that that we didn't know about yes so this 11 unit yes timber and hall, hall self-contained that's an, an addition to the facts yes there was also another three bedroom house which she bought for patients butchery she again that's also, different from the oyarifa one yes and the, now wow. the son also comes in because at the point part of the money was used to buy a car for his son Franklin. Now we are told Frank, Franklin is at large. So because of that, when you look at the, the chart sheet, you don't, even though you find him named as an accused person, there's no specific charge preferred against him yet. I see. Because he's still at large. But the brief now, fact of the case, we know he got a car. Yes, we know he got a car. So he likely will be charged with dishonestly receiving. Dishonestly receiving, either you knew or you ought to have known that the money that you received was proceeds of crime. Now there's Yahaya um, Sumaila also being accused for this honestly receiving. He's he an we understand he's an excavator in um, he's an excav uh, excavator operator. What he did or what he allegedly did was that um, Christiana called him to come and then a house was bought in his name at so that that Amahia house that we are talking about. Yeah. He the house was actually bought in his name, allegedly. In the name of this Sumaila. Yes, so he too has been charged with this honestly receiving. So there's more to the expenditure of the money than we actually know. But Alfred, there's one interesting thing that we need to note. Tell me. Because when we were looking at the advice of the AG as to how the police should go about the case, there were some things that the AG uh, directed the police to do. That's right. Forget about the part where he he asks that they extend the investigation to the money laundering, the money laundering and, and the other financial crimes. I mean that will be in respect of a different situation altogether. But respect to this matter, there was a part where, according to the AG, the complainants, mm -hmm. and here I'm talking about the former minister and then um, the, the husband, the husband, that they did not indicate who was the owner of some. 200,000 US dollars. That's right. And then some 300,000 300, euros. euros. But when you look at the charge sheet today, mm -hmm. the, charge sheet, the charge sheet still maintains that the 200,000 um, US dollars, mm -hmm. the 300,000 euros belongs to or is a property of Cecilia Abinadapa. I see. That's his country. Even though they took the recommendation of the AG to decouple the two hundred thousand dollars from the eight hundred thousand dollars, you still find that all the monies in there are said to be the property of, of Miss um, Cecilia Abinadapa. 
that's inconsistent with what the AG had said earlier, is it not? That the $800,000 said to have been... Belonging to the C. brother C. of... His deceased brother. Exactly. Of which now we know that deceased brother's wife, who's the widow, is also, also said to have been pressing charges money. To, to go but and But on the charge the sheet as we have it, which is the latest, I mean the one we're working with, it mm -hmm. indicates that all the monies in there belong to the... the, 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 the um, former Minister for Sanitation and Water Resources. Interesting developments there. You know what? Th this is playing out in a very interesting way. And, and every day we wake up to new things. Now we know some property that was bought and so on. And now the $1 million, which the AG's advice said that belonged to the brother and others, this new charge sheet still ascribed the $1 million to Cecilia Adapa as the owner of that money. Where do we draw the line? Stay with me. We'll be back shortly after this quick break. Martin Pebble is private legal practitioner. He's going to be joining us right after this quick break for this. Plus, another angle of this story, of the, of the, juvenile, the juvenile angle of this story. Interesting. We'll be back shortly after this quick break. Martin Pebble joins us. This is Ghana Tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to demonstrate to you the superior properties of Flamingo paint as compared to other paint brands on the market. We take equal quantities of Flamingo paint and this ordinary paint. We then dilute them with water. And now, let the test begin. The gentleman on the left is going to apply the ordinary paint and the gentleman on my right will use the Flamingo superior paint. As you can clearly see, Flamingo has the obvious better hiding. Furthermore, Flamingo has painted a much larger area. You know, one bucket of Flamingo paint is equal to several buckets of any other paint brand on the market. Flamingo paint is made with superior formulation to give superior durability, superior hiding, superior coverage. Flamingo paint, simply superior. Oh, Jam, you're looking good, oh, my friend. Is that something you're not telling me? Yes, I'm feeling very good and strong. What is the secret? It is not a secret. My farmer used Yara Miller Activa on me two weeks after planting. This boosted my growth. Then after, he used Yara Bella Sulfan as top dressing when I was at knee length. My goodness and strength is because of Yara Miller Activa and Yara Bella Sulfan. Yara fertilizers have nitrite based fertilizers that are readily available for plant upkeep and do not over acidify the soil. Yara fertilizers also contain micronutrients such as zinc, boron and manganese which aid in yield and crop quality. If you want to look good like me, then your farmer must go for Yara fertilizers. They are available in accredited agri-input shops nationwide. For more information, call 0308-251-060 or visit our webpage at yara.com.gh or Facebook page. And there is more. Yara retailers can also benefit from selling Yara products by just downloading Yara Connect app and scanning QR codes on the Yara sack at the point of sale to end rewards. Use Yara fertilizers for better yields and quality produce. Everybody knows Acrobato. And if you know Acrobato, it means you know M Punch Homeopathy Clinic. M Punch Homeopathy Clinic is my pillar. Let's hear what others are saying about M Punch Homeopathy Clinic. Who will be careful for M Punch Wana? Ha! Yes, <laughs> I'm 
me do so sema na enko ye e pastor na maye me nyina na magina sabema na me ni bi fie for there e ho na nyina e ji arisa you got that right a half secret and point is my secret and point from your party clinic every movers and shakers in the world of business and the academia come together for the free business tv3 thought leadership lecture series under the theme Ghana's claim of economic self governance and independence a myth reality or the need for a paradigm shift the lecture will bring together economic gurus who will deliberate to find the way forward for the economy of Ghana main speaker Kwame Pienim renowned economist panelist Mark Bedwabaji CEO Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry Professor Godfrey Buckping a professor of finance and economist at the University of Ghana Business School Joe Jackson director of operations Delex Finance at Obia Esiama Abaji vice chair the Association of Ghana Industries the branch date Wednesday, August 9, 2023, at 9.30 a.m. Prompt at the Executive Theatre, TV3. Be part of this economic summit and let's move the country forward together. The Three Business TV3 Thought Leadership Lecture Series, exclusive to TV3. TV3, first in news, best in entertainment. Hey, hey! What do you do with some cool 2000 Welcome back. This is Ghana Tonight. We're live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook. Now, as we've shown you the twist and turns of this is the Adapa case. Now, the latest is that we have eight persons who have been identified as suspects in this case. And a student of law here, my colleague, Dennis Port, Barry Wadam, giving us uh, updates and, and running us through how the situation has evolved from day one to this point. Martin Pebo is private legal practitioner. Thank you so much for joining us, Lawyer Martin Pebo. Now, you've been following the juvenile aspect of this case, which we didn't know until recently. W what are the details of that? So, because under the law, we are not to disclose details of juveniles, etc. I'm just talking in general. I right. have not mentioned anybody's name. So I just mentioned what I know. Okay. Yes. So um, a juvenile was taken to court. And then Madame Dapa, so yes, in that particular one, Madame Dapa's uh, husband was the complainant. Now, when you got to fast forward, when you got to Madame Dapa's turn to give evidence then even though she had not expressly made a complaint of the one million dollars now we are we are hope now we all accept that yes it's her money because i understand that in the amended charge sheet now they've left the issue of her diseased brother out are, are we on the same page Ms. Okansi? yes indeed we are in fact uh, that's where it, it leads us to the, the next issue because Dennis just pointed out that fact that now the one million has been captured on this new charge sheet as belonging to Cecilia Dapa. Oh, yeah. Tana has said that, look, she's owner of that uh, 800,000. That makes sense because the other one was a cock and bull story, and it's good we kept denying it. I mean, kept saying that it didn't make sense to us as citizens. Okay, but let's come back to the juvenile case. So the main, the upshot of it is that. When they got to Madame Dapa's time to give evidence, then she, she, as part of her evidence, she kept crying about the money. She, she came with a bag. That money in the bag had been stolen by that juvenile. Ah, so lawyers had to put it to her that, Madame, listen, you haven't made a case of, uh, what do you call it, stolen money. Uh -huh. You haven't added cash as part of the case. In actual fact, the complainant, even on the charge sheet, is the husband, Mr. Daniel Osef before. Right, mm -hmm. and she came to testify about some of the items that were lost. So it's the kente and the other stuff, the jewelry. Those were the matters that they brought to court. But in the course of giving evidence, Madame Dapa was consistently crying about the money. Uh, uh, yes, she was they crying. Did not stole money. It even became a problem between her and the prosecution. When we say prosecution, that's the police. You know, the attorney general. It doesn't have enough lawyers. So when a case yeah. is small, so to speak, I'm that, speaking lay language, that's true. certain offenses, the police are allowed to prosecute. Then very high and sensitive ones, the attorney general's lawyers will prosecute. So this one, the prosecutor is a police uh, man, 
and then the investigator was a policeman. So it brought confusion in their camp because they were very clear that Madame Dapa didn't add money. Money wasn't part of the uh, charge sheet. Yet when she was in the box and was being cross-examined, she kept crying about that money. So is that money that's now come up forcefully? So you see from the one I've been saying that there was a certain juvenile. Yes, and the juvenile, that's to say that a person below uh, 18 years who is in conflict with the law. So that is the angle of the juvenile. So at a point, then that juvenile absconded. So that is what stalled the trial because the juvenile was no longer coming to court. The case stalled. And then fast forward, we have what we have today. I see. And in fact, this is captured in the new chart sheet that uh, we also have a copy of that sometime in October 2022. That's how things started playing out. But for you, based on the the case details available to you, as in when you, you started following this sometime in 2022, the money belongs to Cecilia Dapa, as against what the AG had earlier advised, that some $800,000 belonged to the deceased husband and, and, and otherwise. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you see how, I mean, well, we say in uh, local Ghanaian English, how God works. You see, yeah, the truth is not coming out because that story that belongs to the diseased brother, I don't know the diseased brother, but Mr. Khan say, you know, the publication in Ghana web did and other sources showing that neighbors had come out to say, no, the diseased brother couldn't have owned that amount of money and that the diseased brother, with due respect, was a shoemaker in circumstances where they didn't think he owned that amount of money. We are not saying shoemakers can't make that much. There are some who are richer than that. But in the case of this particular shoemaker, they said, no, he couldn't have owned that much. Then you saw the other angle where the widow, now that they said the money belonged to the deceased brother, you see the widow has retained a lawyer who is uh, about suing to recover the money. So now Madame Dapa is beating a retreat. Yes, she will have to beat a retreat because the lawyer is preparing to sue. And that one too is been published. I also read it uh, online. You say, yes, so... It's good that Madame Dapa is owned up, uh, that, that is it, because the other one was just belittling our intelligence, our citizens. It was just too insulting to us. It, it just didn't add up. And another fact, look, Mr. Kansas, let me mention that there is even a third angle oh, uh, to rate. If it's before see. the case came to juvenile court, the case had earlier been presented to a circuit court. Circuit court. That was when they saw that the person that was presented before that court was a juvenile. All then right. they had to stop. So a lawyer went to that court and raised the objection that, no, when uh, you have a juvenile, you cannot try the juvenile in the circuit court. Yes, that is our law under the Juvenile Justice Act, Act 653. So with the intervention of the lawyer, they stopped that first case. So the original first case was in the circuit court. But with the objection raised by the lawyer, then they stopped it before they came to the juvenile court. And then... In the juvenile court, as I mentioned, Madame Dapa kept crying. She wailed about that money. It was no joke. Yes. Yes, so that is the point. And it's good now. She's really admitted that that is uh, her money. And so she'll be facing the special prosecutor. Wow. Okay, let me stop here. Uh, so indeed. You, <laughs> interesting. Because this this case is, is evolving quite fast than we, we even expect. So with the details that we have in this new chart, it also points to a, a different point altogether. In fact, with this juvenile aspect of it, the deputy AG is quoted as saying that the police did not make uh, this docket available to, to them when they asked that the police did not inform the attorney general's office about this initial case at the juvenile court, which you have just explained. But they actually admit that there is evidence of an arrest warrant against the first accused. That's the younger house help in October 2022. Where am I, The policeman informing the AG, to be honest with you, because we are all human and we make mistakes, mm -hmm. uh, it's, 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 it's unfortunate. So we say it's regrettable, very regrettable. But it does happen, mm, you know, so I'm like, like I've seen quite a, a, a number of them. And as I say, even we also as lawyers, from time to time, we make mistakes. So I, 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 I 
actually my thoughts are still evolving. So at this stage, I would say that it's regrettable. Yes, we all want to improve. We all want excellence. Mm -hmm. So when a mistake happens, yes, we have to show remorse for it and then look at putting in uh, measures to curb the recurrence of such mistakes. I so see. That's my now, as we're talking, people who are watching us live on Facebook, TV3 Ghana, asking questions. James Nsombe, uh, you have John Bosco, Akotia, Shani Mubarak, all asking specific questions about what the AG said previously about this, this $1 million, that 800000 belong to the past dead or deceased brother and then the 200,000 undisclosed. And so the police should investigate that. Plus what we are seeing in this new chart sheet or the amended chart sheet that the 1 million actually in total is said to be property of Cecilia Dapa. Would you subscribe to those who say is it because of this, the widow of Cecilia Dapa's deceased brother now coming up to say, you know what? I didn't know my husband, my deceased husband had this money. So give me a share of it that may have changed events. You know, the way it is, um, once again, you know, this case is always, is, is evolving. This case is evolving. So I can't rule it out. And it makes sense. <clears throat> it makes a lot of sense. It's reasonable. Yes, because that's a huge sum of money. So that if Madame Dapa were to continue on the path that that money belongs to a diseased brother, yes, by all means, the disease. Uh, brother's widow and their children who have to claim it. And that's how come they have uh, properly retained a lawyer, uh, lawyer Kusi, right? Yeah, who is uh, working on it and is about to recover that money from Madame Cecilia Dapa. So, yes, you can rule out the fact that perhaps is the fear and the stress and everything of the lawyer trying to recover the money from her. That is making a bit a retreat, make a U-turn to the original position. So yes, it has to be granted. You know, at this stage, every day, I can't help but to repeat that in a population of 30 or 32 million citizens, it will be strange that nobody would think that that is the reason Madame Dapa is beating a retreat. Right. It will be strange. So let's grant citizens who uh, are of the firm conviction that it's because of the stress, the wahala, the widow's lawyer is going to give Madame Dapa. That is why she's beating a retreat and now claiming the one million. Uh, that that's the eight hundred thousand dollars and the two hundred. Okay, put together the one million dollars. We'll see how the coming days will look like on this. Every day presents something new. In this case, lawyer Martin people, thank you so much for joining us here. I'm gonna tonight. Coming up next, the coup in Niger is beginning to have a negative impact on cross-border trade especially and the Ghanaian markets are beginning to feel the heat. We are in the Ajin Kutuku onion market to assess the situation. We also have key players um, in, in this particular case also joining us on this. But the coup in Niger may be miles away from the Ghanaian jurisdiction but the effect is already being felt in the markets here in this country with up to 70 Ghanaian bound onion loaded trucks stuck at borders in the cool riddled country traders say prices may double if no intervention comes through in the coming days my colleague Enyongam Haliga visited the onion market at Ajen Kotoku details and that's what we have now and we're going to show you later that uh, the huge amounts of uh, imports of onions from Niger would point to you why this is a, a serious case.
yesterday. We spoke to the leader of this Ajankotokoto onion market leaders there. Take a look. The government will intervene. And for that matter, as you can see, we have a lot of our trucks being stuck at the border, some at Mali border and Burkina and Benin. So we are appealing to the government to intervene so that we will not be at, at loss. For, for now, we are at loss because the, the, there's a scarcity, scarcity of the union. And for that matter, we need the government to intervene. Oh, yeah, no, yesterday I, we, I talked with one of our drivers at uh, the Benin border day. And then they were allowed to move. That was yesterday. But immediately after they moved this morning, the rest of the tracks were blocked again. Again. So as you can see, we have about 70 tracks. I don't know if you, 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 you have you seen that one, the cabbage, yes. We have about 72 trucks which are damaged, total damage. So when uh, he, you talk about, the, you heard him talk about the trucks totally damaged, talking about the onions in there, 70 trucks loaded with onions bound for Ghana have all gone bad because of what we're dealing with. And these are the trucks he's talking about. And this we got from one of the drivers of these trucks. Now they are at the Benin border. They've moved from Niger, and they are the Benin. In fact, some of them are heading towards Burkina Faso as well. And all these borders have been closed. And so that's what you see, the perishable items, onions in there, which have gone bad, 70 trucks, we're seeing. And now let me take you into the, the statistics so you have an understanding of what we're dealing with. Niger is one of the major countries of the onions we consume in this country, the origin. In 2012, according to the OEC, and then also some other data that we gathered, you can see there in 2012, $5 million worth of onions was imported into this country. And then also in 2020, $7.8 million. In 2021, you see there, $21.7 million worth of onions. That's according to the Ghana Agriculture Producers and Traders Organization, GAPTO, and OEC. Data for the source of this data that we're seeing. China as well, we import tomato, that's onions from China, 8.83 million. Yeah. Netherlands, 2021. $928,000. And we're supposed to be an agrarian economy. Okay? So Dr. Charles Nyaba is Executive Director of Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana Tonight. Tell us how this Niger situation, if persists in the coming weeks, could impact on us and our markets. Dr. Nyaba. Okay. Um... As you are aware, uh, in recent times, we get most of our food commodities from uh, our neighboring countries. So when you take the various uh, type of vegetables, like uh, tomatoes, like pepper, like onions, we get them from uh, Burkina Faso, some from Togo, and then the onions specifically from Niger. When you take uh, uh, livestock, like cattle, goat, and sheep, we also get them from the same areas, the Burkina Faso, Mali, and Ize. So obviously, this is going to have serious impact on the supply of those commodities in our markets. And uh, in Ghana, it's not the case that we don't have potential to produce seed. When you take uh, um, onions specifically, which we are getting 100% from uh, Niger. We also get the seeds from the Niger. Galani, for instance, that most farmers are uh, using, which is high yielding, one can is going for two. The onions production, when there is no water, you cannot produce onions. So you look at uh, the farmers who produce onions, most of them are from uh, the white water basin around Boko, Zebra, Volga, Volga areas. They produce the bulk of the onions in Ghana, but still it's highly insignificant to meet our consumption. Even though the area is profitable for onions production, there are other areas 
that we can produce onions. But because of lack of consistent water supply, lack of onion seedlings, and education of farmers in onion production, many farmers are not into onions production. I have I've been having conversations with members who are producing onions. And they tell me that to do one acre of onions, you need an average of uh, between five to 6,000 Ghana cities for one acre. But it's also profitable because you can make uh, the long sack, 15 of that for one acre. And as we speak, a bag of that is going for 1,200 Ghana cities. So we are talking about 16,000 if farmers are able to produce onions. Uh, enough measures to support Ghanaian farmers or uh, onion farmers to grow more to be able to us to uh, make up for this shortfall if this Niger situation persists. Doc, as we speak, um, the main government intervention that promotes agriculture production in Ghana is uh, the planting for food and jobs. Uh, but in 2023, government has suspended implementation of the planting for food and jobs. It was going, the program was going to be reviewed. Uh, the revision has taken place. We were all uh, consulted. The minister and his team went around the country to consult the stakeholders. And we were promised that as the season starts, we we're going to see the new intervention in place. But as we speak, nothing has been done. Um, the input credit system that was going to be replace the fertilizer and seed subsidy program hasn't taken place. Even though in the 2023 budget that was read in November 2022, made a significant budget allocation for agriculture sector. But as we speak, there is no a pressure invested on farmers. So we don't know where that money is. So for onions specifically, if government is going to take emergency measures to direct investment to onions production, it's something that we welcome. But over the years, the onions farmers have not benefited from any support from government, apart from if they also get opportunity to buy fertilizer, uh, the solar fertilizer in the market. But to say government providing farmers with onion seeds is not there. Government supporting farmers with uh, knowledge to produce uh, onions is not there. But, but, supporting uh, but, but, so we, we've just showed a number of trucks that are stuck at the Benin border, 70 trucks in, in the stand, and some of the onions there are going bad. Could this situation influence the price of onions on the market in the coming weeks from your own assessment? I won't be surprised if the same thing will happen. You know, when these things happen, even before those uh, uh, drivers are able to manage to get the trucks to Ghana, the cost that they would have in care and the post service losses that is associated with bringing them is going to make it impossible for them to sell it at a rate that they will have sold. Okay. And uh, if we are to draw lessons from uh, the tomatoes experience, uh, you know, tomatoes is one of the commodities that push our food price inflation to 54%, which is the highest in the sub region. Now, uh, if the same thing to apply to onions, which almost every household consume onions, you can imagine adding onions to tomatoes, what the food price inflation will be in uh, July. So uh, for us, it's going to affect us. We are going to actually experience some kind of a uh, shortage. And then um, if the shortage prices will definitely go up. Uh, and, and, and in some instances, uh, maybe households might not actually consume uh, onions as part of uh, uh, their meals, which has implication on the food and nutritional status. So to me, the best we can just do is to position ourselves and see how we'll be able to embrace this challenge and increase investment in farmers to produce onions. Dr. Charles Nyaba, appreciate your time. Thank you. Pre Executive Director of the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana. I must say thank you so much for staying with us here on Ghana Tonight. Join us same time tomorrow. I am Alfred Kansi. Have a good night. Ghana Tonight is brought to you by Flamingo Paint. Superior durability. Superior hiding. Superior coverage. Simply superior.